The text for this morning comes from Exodus chapter 5. I'll also read part of uh, chapter 6. It's Exodus chapter 5. Of course, we've been, this continues our series on the life of Moses in, and particularly the deliverance of Israel in Exodus. You'll see in this chapter that Moses and Aaron are now approach Pharaoh with the, the demand or the quest of God. Exodus chapter 5, and we'll start reading at verse 1, page 47 of your pew Bible. Exodus chapter 5. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. Or... He may strike us with plagues or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. Then Pharaoh said, Look, the people of the land are now numerous, and you are stopping them from working. That same day, Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and overseers in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw, but require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That is why they are crying out, let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the people so that they keep working and pay no attention to lies. Then the slave drivers and the overseers went out and said to the people, This is what Pharaoh says. I will not give you any more straw. Go and get your own straw wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced at all. So the people scattered all over Egypt to gather stubble to use for straw. The slave drivers kept pressing them, saying, Complete the work required of you for each day, just as when you had straw. And Pharaoh's slave drivers beat the Israelite overseers they had appointed, demanding, Why haven't you met your quota of bricks yesterday or today as before? Then the Israelite overseers went and appealed to Pharaoh, Why have you treated your servants this way? Your servants are given no straw, yet are told, make bricks. Your servants are being beaten, but the fault is with your own people. And Pharaoh said, lazy, that's what you are. Lazy, that's why I, you keep saying, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Now get to work. You will not be given any straw, yet you must produce your full quota of bricks. The Israelite overseers realized they were in trouble when they were told, you are not to reduce the number of bricks required of you for each day. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them. And they said, may the Lord look on you and judge you. You have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. And Moses returned to the Lord and said, Why, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on this people, and you have not rescued your people at all. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but, my name, but by my name the Lord I did not make myself fully known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, 
where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians, and I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. And Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and harsh labor. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the Israelites go out of his country. But Moses said to the Lord, If the Israelites will not listen to me, why would Pharaoh listen to me, since I speak with faltering lips? As for the reading of Scripture. Creation of Christ, we saw, we see here in chapter 5 that the Hebrew enslavement and oppression has not stopped. In fact, it's getting worse. We already saw in chapter 1 that the Hebrew people were enslaved. We saw also that they cried out for help. It seems that nothing happens at first. But God eventually, in chapter 3, he appears to Moses at the burning bush and he says to Moses, you are going to go and you are going to lead my people out of Egypt because I heard their prayer. However, when Moses is commissioned to deliver God's people, he does not believe. He tries to avoid the task. He drags his feet. He complains. But in fact, chapter 4, Moses finally does go. He goes to Egypt and to do what God had told him to do. And he meets with the, the elders of the Hebrew people. And contrary to his expectations, they believe and worship and are thankful. They seem to be on side. Perhaps God can deliver them. And so with the support of the elders and the people in chapter 4, Moses in chapter 5, where our text for today, now he's going to go to Pharaoh, the, the king of Egypt. And he is going to ask Pharaoh to let the people go. Now we can only imagine as chapter 5 begins the fear and trepidation of Moses and Aaron. I mean, the Egyptian palace must have been monumental. You can only imagine, the, given what we've seen of ancient Egypt even today, the soaring ceilings, the acres of gardens, hundreds of guards. This is the epicenter of palace, the incredible paintings on the walls and the, the, the huge pillars. This is the court of the mightiest ruler in the world. And who is Moses? A shepherd from Midian? He's probably dressed in plain clothing. Nothing to his name but a donkey and a staff. Probably smells like animals. This man is going to ask the ruler of Egypt to let a million slaves go? The slaves who have built the storehouses and wealth of Egypt? Well, we'll see. I wonder if Moses even, even believes yet if, whether this is going to work. And it's strange. You can imagine for the Hebrews too. Why do we have to ask Pharaoh? But God is going to make an example of Pharaoh to display his own glory. And Moses goes. And interestingly, God had told Moses 
take the elders with you when you meet Pharaoh, but the elders don't come. That's a very significant detail. The elders are hedging already. They're not sure if God will actually do anything through Moses. But nonetheless, Moses, they, they go to Pharaoh and they say to Pharaoh in verse 1, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Now you might ask, well, why a three-day festival? That seems strange. Isn't God's intention to take the people out of Egypt? But the request for a festival does two things. First, in ancient Egypt, it was common for workers to ask for such a thing. It was routine. And we've learned this from archaeology. It was routine for workers to ask for a few days to worship their gods. And so this should have been a routine request of Moses and Aaron. They're, they're speaking in language that Pharaoh understands. And second, by having Pharaoh reject such a reasonable request, they illustrate how craven and heartless and hard Pharaoh actually is. And therefore, Pharaoh is worthy of the punishment of the plagues that is to come. And it also shows that the Israelites are right to leave Egypt because who, who should serve such a man? Nobody has to serve such a man. And in the ancient Near East, to refuse someone their right to serve their ancestral gods was a huge insult. And oppressive to a degree that's unacceptable by even the standards of the time. You see, it's not just that Pharaoh opposes God, it's that he's oppressive by any standard. Rebellion has to be the way in this case. Moses and Aaron even say in verse 3, let us take this journey because if we don't, our God may punish us. Again, he's speaking in Egyptian thinking. In the Egyptian religion, if you, you had to satisfy the gods so that they didn't punish you. And they're saying, Pharaoh, you are going to cause our God to punish you because of your, like, you're being really cruel. But we find out later that Pharaoh punishes the Egyptians. For, see, the God of the Hebrews, our God, punishes the enslaver, not the enslaved. Unlike the Egyptian gods who don't discriminate. But let's go to our, our, our first point here. We have to think for a second, why is Pharaoh so cruel? What, what, what's motivating this? In verse 2, we find out the nature and why Pharaoh is so cruel. Look at verse 2. Pharaoh's response to Moses and Aaron is, Who is the Lord? Or Yahweh, God's name, that I should obey him and let Israel go. I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. So our first point, Pharaoh's arrogance. You see, the real issue here is not just that Pharaoh's a bad man. The issue is that Pharaoh thinks he's a god. And Pharaoh does not deny the existence of Yahweh, Israel's god. Sure, Yahweh may exist, but I don't care if he exists. I am God in Egypt. Whatever I say goes. And Pharaoh reveals his, himself to be a prideful sinner. And this, what Pharaoh is doing, brothers and sisters, is what sin is. Sin is not just to be bad. Sin is to say, I'm God, and the real God is not. In Romans 1 verse 21, the Apostle Paul speaks about what sin is at core. What's the problem with our world? Well, verse 21, although they, mankind, knew God... They knew God exists. They neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. So sin at core is to say, yeah, there's a God out there, but I see no reason to worship him or acknowledge him. I will be God instead in my own life. Thank you very much. And so we begin to see that the battle between Pharaoh and Moses is not merely a battle of pol politics. It's not just a one group revolting against an unjust government. What this battle is, is it's a battle between the sinful heart of man versus the God. 
versus Yahweh. Is God going to govern this earth according to his plans and ways, or is sinful man going to decide how this earth is organized? It's cosmic. And Pharaoh later says in verse 10, so Moses comes to Pharaoh and he says, thus says the Lord. And then Pharaoh in verse 10 says, thus says Pharaoh. Pharaoh assumes the place of God in Egypt. The Pharaohs, of course, saw themselves as the representative of the gods in Egypt. Is Pharaoh actually God or is Yahweh God? This is how the stage is set for the plagues that are coming. The Pharaoh's arrogance raises two questions for us. Question number one. This is a question that all human beings need to answer. Do I have the right and the freedom to live on God's planet? And do I have the right to ignore him and scoff at him while I live on his planet? And do I have the right to oppress the created people of God while I do so? Even on a logical level, let's think that through for a second. I did not create this world. It existed previously to me. Somebody else made it. Do I have a right to live in this place without acknowledging the person who created this? And can I spurn and ignore the person who created it without consequence? This is what the ten plagues answer. God says, you ignore me, you harden your heart against me, here's the punishment. And it is profound. Maybe you're here today and you're asking this question in your heart. How long can I live in God's world while ignoring him? I don't know the Lord. I don't know him and I don't need to listen. You can try to suggest there's a different God. You can try to say that God doesn't speak to us, but he does. And the ten plagues show that he does. And the ten plagues are God's judgment on Pharaoh's attempt to spurn him. And really, the ten plagues, brothers and sisters, are a preview of hell. The ten plagues are a vision of of what's it like to live in a world where God is punishing us rather than loving us. Water turns to blood. The sun is blotted out. Insects afflict us. Children die. Each template shows us a form of punishment that God can place upon us if we choose to ignore him rather than worship him. Pharaoh experiences this, but he is not the only one who will experience it. Pharaoh's is an example of what will happen to all of us if we don't worship. It is not an easy or fun question to consider. But the Bible is very clear on it. There's a second question. When someone rejects God, what happens to their soul? What kind of person do they become if they disconnect themselves or be disconnected from the the, the God who is love. Has Pharaoh's rejection of Yahweh made him a better person or a worse person? Verse 4, Moses and Aaron say, for Pharaoh says to Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. Look, the people of the land are now numerous and you are stopping them from working. Oh, you want a three-day break to worship your gods. Not in Pharaoh's Egypt. In Pharaoh's Egypt, you work until you die. Your worth and existence is to make him powerful and wealthy. And the word for work in this verse is actually not the word for work. The The word is burden. Get back to your burdens and your afflictions. And, and Pharaoh says, that, you, know, you are stopping them from working. And actually, this word for stop is the word for Sabbath. 
in Pharaoh's Egypt, you don't get to have a Sabbath. You get to work every day until you drop. Forced labor is all of life because you don't ex The powerful get to do with the weak what they want. That's what Pharaoh's heart is filled with. And Pharaoh doesn't even care. Oh, your burdens are heavy? I'll make them heavier. Are you asking for relief? I'll give you double. All that is left in the land. You don't get to even have... If you made mud bricks, you have to fill them with straw. Otherwise, they wouldn't have any strength or integrity. After the harvest, all the straw would be gathered from the, the wheat and the flax and these other crops and be delivered to the mud brick building uh, parts of the, the Nile. Pharaoh's saying, you know, I'm just not going to do that anymore. And this is consequential because if you read the passage carefully, instead of using the straw, so you have the, the roots of the plant, then you have the grain at the top and the straw is what's in between. But Pharaoh says, I'm not going to give you straw, which means that you're going to have to use stubble. You're going to have to use the bottom of the plant that's left over in the field and the roots. And you have to pull up the roots in this tiny little uh, stubble that's left, and that's what you're going to make the bricks with. So I'm going to deliberately make your job harder than it has to be. And that is abject cruelty. It's actually, it crosses the line from forcing someone to work, and now it's crossing into torture. He takes joy in inflicting punishment on them. This is part of the reason God, the, the plagues are so harsh for Pharaoh. Because he is a man, he's an abuser. He is a man who is cruel to the core. He forsakes God and it warps his soul and turns it black as sin. And part of the message of Exodus, brothers and sisters, is that Pharaoh's Egypt is what this world would look like without God. In a land where God is not God and Pharaoh is God, this is what life is like. And you might say, well, hold on a second. Not everyone in Egypt suffered like the Hebrews. Okay. So the Hebrews were enslaved and that was awful. What about the Egyptians? Didn't they enjoy a good life? Well, not really. Because they were co-opted in the cruelty of Pharaoh. Is it less... Is it less of a burden to be the person inflicting cruelty versus the person receiving cruelty? You might say yes, I would say no. To be forced to live in a cruel and unjust state where you're forced to be cruel to other people is a weight and, and a brokenness of your own soul. Everyone in Pharaoh's Egypt is corrupted by cruelty. It is not a good world. This is planet Earth without God. The only reason the whole Earth isn't like this is because God intervenes and prevents it. Now I want to extend this metaphor a tad bit further before we move on. Pharaoh's Egypt is what happens when sin becomes the standard and, and principle of all of life in, in the land. But sin isn't just this way in Egypt. This, sin will do this in your family life if you let sin flourish there. Sin will do this in your individual life if you let sin rule there. Think of an abusive household. One person in the household uses their strength or power to abuse and mistreat the other people in it. The abuser denies God, obviously, makes himself God. And then inflicts cruelty by force because who's going to punish him? He has the power or she has the power. Cruel people think that the possession of power gives them the right to do whatever they want. That's sin. The irony is that you will do this to yourself if you let sin rule in your life. That's what sin does. Let's go to the next uh, point, the overseers. In our text, there are two reactions to the cruelty of, of Pharaoh. The first is that of the overseers, and the second is that of Moses. 
We see in verse 15 that the overseers, of course, they're beaten for not making enough bricks. They're beaten by Pharaoh's officials. And then in verse 15, they go and they appeal to Pharaoh. It's very interesting what they say when they go back to Pharaoh. They say, why have you treated, now listen, your servants this way? And again, your servants are given no straw, yet we are told make bricks. Your servants are being beaten, but the fault is with your own people. Your servants, your servants, your servants. The overseers heard the message of Moses and Aaron that God was going to deliver the people. They knew that message. And yet, they don't believe it. They think that the only way out of their situation is to appeal to their abuser, to appeal to the enslaver. They're more Egyptian than Hebrew. They don't believe. They accept their slavery as the default state of life. Pharaoh, of course, unpredictably rejects their plea. Pharaoh has decided to be cruel. When people decide to be cruel in their sin, they don't stop. You know, one of our struggles in, in this life, Christians too, Christians can be gullible. We, as Christians, we often struggle to see evil as evil. We're always trying to downplay someone's evil. But when someone's heart turns black and it turns cruel, which often happens in our world, it's, that's what's happening. It's cruelty in the core. It does us no favors to deny it. People are like this. This is no favors to go, yeah, but they had a bad this, bad this, yeah, but you know, there's no, there's no excuses either. And you don't need to negotiate with sin, you have to defeat it and oppose it. The Pharaoh says, You're lazy. You're lazy. Your your appeal is, is worthless. And again, there's a lie. It's not true. It's not that they're lazy. But let's, let's apply this. We've already talked about how Pharaoh's Egypt is a metaphor for sin. The question then becomes, how do I respond to a world like ours? Where do I find hope and relief if this is too often the default? The overseers think the solution is to negotiate with sin. And let me put this into practical terms for today. Let's say that you're an alcoholic or maybe a a drug addict. In your life, a substance rules over you. You cannot live without your substance, your alcohol, your, your, the drug of choice that you have. Now, if you are addicted to some sort of substance, what should you do? What do your friends and family hope you will do? Do they hope that you will say, oh, instead of drinking one liter of vodka today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to cut down to half a liter? Or, I'll keep drinking, but when I visit with people, I'll try to cut down before I visit. This is what what I've heard alcoholics say. Is it a good life to be half addicted to alcohol versus entirely addicted? What's freedom for someone who's addicted to a substance? Well, freedom is to stop using the substance entirely. Freedom is to be healed from the addiction. But why don't people who are addicted go to rehab and get healed? Well, deep down, most of them don't believe they can be healed. Humanly speaking, they know they can't do it. They know it. They've accepted that they are a slave. And and humanly speaking, they're probably right. Humanly speaking, they're not going to get out. That's why every person who beats addiction that I'm aware of only does so by asserting faith in a higher power, Jesus Christ, hopefully. 
Because to beat something that's bigger than you requires something bigger than the thing that's beating you. You have to believe that power exists in our reality to defeat the enslaver. Faith is the beginning of the journey out. Faith is the beginning of freedom. Can God heal me? Will he heal me? Does God love me enough to actually heal me of this thing and give me victory? Or am I just enslaved and that's the end of it? And the only thing I can do is negotiate with my enslaver to give me a slightly better slavery. Oh man, so many of us are doing this. Some of us are living under trauma. We've had serious trauma in our past. And it affects our nervous system, it affects our mood, it affects our, so much in our lives. And this is serious. And it's usually bigger than us. Like we, we, if, if we look at it, we're like, I can't, I can't fix this or get better than this. And often the choice is implicitly made, I'm going to remain in the consequences of my trauma. I'm just going to live with the crushing anxiety and depression and all of these things. Sometimes we even say, go to the point and we say, well, you, this is just it's who I am, a trauma, a trauma sufferer. Is that what God wants for us? Do you think God can provide healing? Yes. You don't have to live under that label. There is a measure of healing. You may not fully heal in this life. I grant that. But it is possible to not let the thing own you. Or here's a, another one. Some of us live our lives under crushing fear and worry. God says in his word, don't worry because I will protect you and take care of you. But we don't believe God will take care of us in the way that we would hope. And so in the area of fear, we act like atheists. And we think that worry will be the way that we manage our fear. We make excuses like, well, worry is how I love my family. If I didn't worry about them, you know, my love for them wouldn't be expressed. Worry is how I identify threats. It's how I protect myself. If I didn't worry, I wouldn't see things coming. Or we make it pious. Worry is how God humbles me, so it's something I need in my life. Really? Do we believe so little in God that we think that fear has to be our whole existence? That we negotiate with our enslavement? Is a life of worry, filled with worry, just normal? We just have to worry a little bit less? Do you actually think God can give you freedom from something like that? Because he can. If he could deliver Israel from Egypt, he can deliver you from your fears. But if you don't believe that, it ain't going to happen. Here's another one, maybe a little different. One of my... Uh, Friends I know, multiple friends I know, they work as pastors and missionaries in Papua New Guinea. And in Papua New Guinea, the people are enslaved by this sort of witchcraft, ancestor religion, and it's really dark. And many people in that culture, they, they love what Christianity offers, the victory and freedom and power over this darkness. But many of them, they come to church and they don't really believe that Jesus can deliver them. And so on the side, they pay off the witch doctor. They have all sorts of these ceremonies that they're a part of. They wear amulets, all these, this stuff. They're hedging. They're afraid of all this stuff and so they try to serve it and negotiate with it so that it doesn't attack them instead of living in the freedom of Christ who gives them power to defeat all that stuff. And that's happened, that happens, we've seen it there. And all of sin in life works this way. I mean, pornography, lust, addiction, there are all these dark things. And the question you have to ask is, do I negotiate with it? 
or do I appeal to the Lord to crush it? Am I a slave or am I going to live in freedom? Now, freedom won't come easily. Israel learned that too. But God says it will come and he will do it if we come to him. Who is God? What does he promise you? Look at verse, chapter 6, verse 6. Look what, he, look what God says. And I want to read each line in turn. Look at Therefore say to the Israelites... I am the Lord. How does God identify himself and describe himself? Well, listen. Number one, I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. Point one. Number two, I will free you from being slaves to them. Two. Three, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will judge and destroy your enslaver. Three or four. I'm losing count. Verse seven, I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Not only will I destroy that which enslaves you and rescue you, I will take you to myself and you will become part of my family. I will adopt you. And I will be your God. I am yours. You will belong to me. Next. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. I will tell you about me. Verse 8. And look what he does. I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. You will become mine and I will bring you to a land of freedom and joy the promised land of Israel, but also the new earth in heaven. That is your God. The question is not, can he or will he deliver me? The question is, when? Will you stop negotiating with the devil and your own sin and find freedom? God promises it to you. And there's more to it, too. The overseers, they meet Moses and Aaron later in the chapter after, in verse uh, 18, 19, and 20. They left Pharaoh. They found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them. And they said, may the Lord look on you and judge you. You have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. And you think, wait a second. This is so twisted and perverted. Is Moses and, are Moses and Aaron at fault for the suffering of Israel? You, Moses, put the sword in his hand to kill us. Really? Is the problem that is the people who want the freedom of Christ? Is God the problem in our lives, really? No. The problem is that we live in the devil's world. That is the problem. Suffering is the result of sin, not God. God did not create the world with suffering in it, did he? We did. We did that. We caused that problem. Why does God get the blame? We're all like alcoholics. We, we drink a liter of vodka a day, and then we complain about getting liver cancer. God allowed me to get... No, really? The problem with your life isn't God, but the sin. The problem is Pharaoh. It's not Moses' fault. God can defeat Pharaoh, but we have to believe that he can. That's our, our last point. Moses questions God, but prays. Verse 22, Moses returns to the Lord and he prays. At first he questions God. He says in verse 22, Why, Lord, why have you brought me trouble on my people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble, evil. The word is evil. He brought evil on... No, actually, it's... it's he has... Or you, God, have caused evil to fall on the people. That's the literal translation. And then the final accusation of Moses, you have not rescued your people. 
Again, Moses is faithless as well. But Moses does something different than everybody else. Moses goes to the Lord in prayer and faith. Moses is saying this. Notice, what he's, notice what's not being said. What's not being said is that Moses believes God can save. Unlike the overseers who had no expectation of that. That's faith. Moses is questioning why God hasn't saved yet. That's faith. And he goes to the Lord. Implicitly, he's saying, God, if you don't save us, nobody will. That's faith again. Earlier, we read Psalm 77, and in that Psalm, Asaph, the author of the Psalm, questions God. He says, Will God never show his favor again? Has his promise failed? Has God forgotten to be merciful? We're often in this position where we're questioning God's love for us. We're questioning whether he's going to save us. The people in the Bible are full of that. But then in Psalm 77, the psalmist remembers something. You remember in verse 14, he says, Wait, you are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeemed your people. Wait, God has saved people before in mighty, remarkable ways. Yeah, he's going to save us again. It's going to happen. I need to wait for it. And what's incredible about Moses' prayer is how quickly God moves for Moses. God says in chapter 6, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of the country. Moses, God has a plan. He's going to do it. And God carefully designs his plan to show the whole world, including Pharaoh, that God is going to do the rescuing. Why? Why does God need that? Why do we need to see the Lord's glory in this? Because, brothers and sisters, you need to learn that it is God who saves. Not you. Not Moses. Imagine Moses would have gotten his way. He went to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said, sure, the people can go. No problem. Well, then it would have been that Moses saved God's people. No, it has to be done in such a way that they see that God did it. Because in, the, in, in, in truth, in the end of the matter, it's God who does it. That's the thing we need to learn from this. Only the Lord can save you. Negotiating with your enslaver is not going to save you. Appealing to the Lord in faith and, and demanding based on his promises, your, the deliverance, that is the thing that will get you out. That is what Moses has to learn. And Pharaoh is going to learn it too, but on the flip side. Look at what God says. This is all I'll finish here with this. I am the Lord. Who is the Lord? Is he like Pharaoh? Is he just a different version of Pharaoh? No. I will bring you out. I will free you from slavery. I will redeem you. I I will pay the price to those who enslave you. I will pay the debt you owe. This is pointing to Christ. I will take you to be my own people. I will bring you to a land of flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord. Again, we see the gospel. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God promises you victory, brothers and sisters. He promises you deliverance and freedom. It may not happen immediately. He has a plan. The when is not up to us but it will happen. If not in this life, then in the next. But you know, brothers and sisters, in my experience, and I'm just one humble man, I've seen plenty of victory in this life too. And this victory in Exodus is in this life. The Israelites didn't have to wait till heaven for freedom. They got it in their own lifetime. At least their children did. Don't be satisfied with far too little. Don't be satisfied with sin and having just slightly less of it. Aim for freedom and God will give it to you. But you have to believe 
And you have to repent of your sin. And you have to put your faith in Jesus. Because only Jesus Christ can enter your life with the Holy Spirit in a way that pushes out all the sin. Because you're not leaving your slavery to enslave yourself again to your own desires. You're leaving your slavery to enter life with Jesus, who is God and Lord over you, but the Lord of freedom. Give your life to him, and he will free you from Pharaoh. Amen.